The series premiere kicks off with this mysterious man, James Keziah Delaney. Starting on a ship just off the coast, the man makes the journey from water to land where on his way into London, he makes a pit stop to bury a small bag. Once in the city, the burials continue, but this time it's an older man being prepared for his final resting place. During the funeral service, onlookers, including the man's daughter, Zilpha Geary, are paying their respects, until in walks a ghost. Dear God, there walks a dead man, is overheard upon Delaney's appearance. Mrs. Geary is especially spooked, considering Delaney's weird behavior and the fact that he's her brother. They said you were dead, she confronts him. I am, he ominously replies. As she leaves the wake, he grabs her, confessing that he still loves her, and it sure seems to be much more Jamie and Cersei Lannister sibling love than Ross and Monica Geller. Waiting outside for Delaney is his father's lawyer, Thoit. The man has good news and bad news. His mad father named him as his sole heir, but there are no riches, only a small strip of coastline on the other side of the world. If America were a pig facing England, it's right at the pig's ass, he says, proving he would be a terrible real estate agent. Just rocks and Indians. Despite proclaiming it useless and dangerous, Thoit offers to help Delaney sell it, an offer he walks away from. It's quickly clear why Thoit was so eager to help facilitate a deal, he's working with the East India Trading Company. A large contingent of the company has come together to get an update on Delaney and his claim on the land, Nootka Sound. One of them, Mr. Wilton offers an entertaining and informative report for the men on Delaney's background. He was once a company boy, serving in Stuart Strange's regiment, and had a perfect record, until his troubles began in 1800. A few of his incidents included drunken experiments, fights with bears, and raving about hidden treasures, before disappearing in Africa, presumed dead aboard a sunken slave ship. If that wild backstory weren't enough, there are rumors of his whereabouts the last decade, which Strange really wants to know about. The Delaney Welcome Home Tour continues as he returns to his actual childhood home. And he's greeted by something he hasn't seen in a while, somebody who is happy to see him. It's his family butler, Brace, who he shares an embrace and a drink. The reunion turns dark as Delaney reveals that he knows more of his father, mother, and the mysterious land than Brace assumed. It turns out Nootka is the name of his mother's tribe. His father bought both his wife and land from them in exchange for gunpowder. The night ends with Delaney having a troubling vision that is definitely not the result of too much brandy. In the morning, he does receive new information from Brace, Thoit has been attempting to buy Delaney's shipping company for years, a move that Delaney's father would always respond to by sending Horse S. back. As a new offer arrives and being short of Horse S., Delaney resorts to throwing it in the fire. Setting off to check out the company's abandoned offices, Delaney finds another familiar face, someone who as a child touched his heart and other parts of his body. It turns out that prostitute Helga, who happened to take Delaney's virginity, has also taken over the building for her business. She tries to make a deal, whether it be financial, sexual, or by threat. Please do not misunderstand the situation. You send me twelve men, I will return you twelve sets of testicles, he replies. This speech both makes me never want to cross Tom Hardy and makes Helga suddenly recall the man before her. If I give you a girl, I will never see her again. To which he replies, you heard right. As if he hadn't had enough reunions, Delaney is soon accosted by an old man who wants money. He's not just some beggar, it turns out that he's been raising Delaney's brother for ten years. Being a man of his word, Delaney later delivers payment for past, present, and future. He does want to catch a glimpse of the boy, but shares that he never wants to see him again. I'm not a fit man to be around children, he says as everyone at home nods along in agreement. While Delaney has been off catching up with prostitutes, butlers, and illegitimate brothers, his sister has been home attempting to write him a note. Her husband, Thorne, who is rightfully worried about what Delaney's sudden reappearance means to their claim on Nootka, has some rewrite ideas for the letter. He wants her to offer her half-brother fifty pounds to relinquish his rights and leave the country or he will kill him. I'm tired of the empty threats you keep banding around, she says, verbally jabbing her husband. As Thorn storms off, Zilpha stares off, presumably thinking of her brother and still giving off those Lannister vibes. Suspecting foul play, Delaney digs his father up to have a doctor examine him. 
As the doctor does his work, Delaney begins having more troubling visions. This time, he rants and screams at the stiff bodies. I have no fear for you and I have no guilt for you, he says to one body, which seems to rise from the dead. Thankfully, he was imagining that and the doctor has the results. Tests show that his father was given heavy doses of poison over a short time, something that would affect his mind. It's now time for Delaney to have one final reunion. He goes to the East India Company to meet with Strange and his cohorts. Not one for small talk, the man who has seemingly been nowhere to be found for a decade reveals that he knows more than he lets on. He knows that Nootka is a point of contention between enemy countries Britain and the United States and that whoever has the land also has Vancouver, which serves as the gateway to China. Offended by his lack of patriotism, the group attempts to make an offer to him, but like Thoit's letter earlier, Delaney has no use for it. I studied your methods at your school, and I do know the evil you do because I was once part of it, he passionately states, not appreciative of the threats thrown his way. After the brash man storms out, Strange declares, the son is as unstable as the father. Even though we never met the father, that sure is saying something. After a long day of catching up with old acquaintances, Delaney is greeted at home by a second letter from his dear sister, acknowledging that her earlier note was written under the supervision of her husband. She shares that she was grateful that he left England for both of their sakes. I hope I can trust you to keep the secrets of the past buried, reads the letter as he burns it. Buried in a deeper grave. Oh yeah, definitely a Lannister situation going on and that probably includes the brother from earlier being more like a son. What did you think? Are you intrigued by the mysteries and Hardy's performance? The episode 2 begins with Stuart Strange threatening to dismiss one of his many underlings. The only thing that can stop it is the death of Delaney. Well, that being said, he's sure to be unhappy with the latest happenings. Delaney returned to recover his buried bag of diamonds, which he immediately dug into to buy a Spanish ship in the name of the Delaney Nutka Trading Company. That f***ing man will hang for treason, declares Wilton, echoing the feeling of his boss. Unsurprisingly, Strange continues to be frustrated by the situation. After breaking down Delaney's actions out loud, he has a theory on who is behind all of this. The f***ing Americans, he exclaims. Seems unlikely that Matthew Reese and Kerry Russell would be involved, but smart cross-programming. While Delaney may have gained a ship, he's lost a horse. Left in the place of his missing animal is a note that reads, Atticus. He knows exactly what this means, tracking down this man for what appears to be a tense showdown. As crazy as Delaney is, even he should be scared of Atticus. Not only is he played by Stephen Graham, aka Boardwalk Empire's Al Capone, but Atticus is also sporting a bald head covered in tattoos, blood on his face, dirty teeth, and a butcher knife. Thankfully for everyone involved, the two appear to be more friends than rivals, so no fight, just a sit down. Plus, it's been too long since Delaney had a reunion. Delaney is worried about recovering his horse, while Atticus is much more curious about the largest and smallest thing that Delaney saw in Africa. Human kindness, he replies, before changing to a more literal answer of an ant. In the least shocking news ever, turns out that Atticus is the person that people go to when they want someone killed. And such an occasion took place last year when a man wanted Delaney's father dead. Apparently, having a heart of gold, Atticus sent them away. Despite the perceived favor, Delaney wants something else from this scary man, to be his eyes and ears. Well, the enemies you're staring at James, you'll be needing them old boy. If we didn't already have enough of our favorite British TV actors on Taboo, Sherlock's Mark Gatiss shows up and looks as if he brought his Mycroft Holmes fat suit with him. He's playing the feisty and overweight Prince Regent, who gets a visit from Solomon Co-op. The Prince is unhappy for many reasons. The first is that the maps of the blockade of trading ships feature the US in red, which he sees as ironic considering they are the ones who wear red. More pressing are his issues with the rival country. I have run out of f***ing patience, he screams. He wants their ships sunk and survivors hung. This all caught Coop off guard, considering that he came to discuss the East India Company. F them as well, barks the prince. I intend to, replies Coop with a smirk. Even though we're only two episodes into Taboo, Delaney has accrued quite the list of enemies, making his decision to take a late-night stroll on a cloudy, creepy night that much more daring. 
Lucky for him, the only person following him turns out to be Winter, a young girl who lives with Helga and the prostitutes. She warns him that Helga has hired a man to kill him. The girl agrees to take Delaney out to the Silver Tooth Man's boat, which seems like a very trusting move on both of their parts. Once within a reasonable distance of the ship, Delaney jumps into the water to swim aboard. After sneaking around, he finds no one and sets the ship ablaze. Returning to the boat, he discovers that the girl is gone. So it begs the question, are we dealing with a ghost girl situation? The next day, Delaney goes looking for Helga and interrupts one of her sessions. Considering the frequency with which he has visions, he rightfully wants to know if Winter is real. She denies knowing such a girl, insisting she wished she did because her Danish customers would love it. I'm smelling a little, will they or won't they, vibe to these two, a possibility that only gets amplified when he takes off her wig and says, I like to see what lies beneath. You have goodness in you. After staring into her eyes, he concludes that Winter is her daughter, a theory that Helga doesn't deny. He wants to know where the silver-toothed man is and attempts to recruit her like he did Atticus. Continuing his streak of strange and unsettling nights, Delaney heads to inspect his new ship. He does what any new owner would do, looks around, tests the chains, has a breakdown, gets naked, spends the night chained up, and has flashbacks to a sunken slave ship. Nothing out of the usual for Delaney. Once, he's done with that, he decides to handle a more important matter, finding out who is trying to kill him. His investigation begins with Dr. Dumbarton. Dumbarton is no ordinary doctor, he's an American spy if Delaney and his secret code is to be believed. Delaney has a small request, a sit-down with the US president. The doctor is rightfully skeptical of the man before him, pulling a gun and ordering him to leave. You're mad to have even come here, he says, clearly not knowing how mad he really is. We're an angry nation. To which Delaney responds, I'm counting on it. Delaney's day of errands continues with a stop at Thoit's office. It's time for the reading of his father's will. For about the fiftieth time, Thoit asks about Nutka, with Delaney informing him that he intends to use it for trading, but unfortunately, his recently purchased ship was once used to carry slaves by the East India Company, whom Thoit reports to. You are their whore, Delaney says. The same as almost everyone else in this city, apart from those who are actually labeled a whore. Also present for the will reading are Zilpha, her bitter husband, and a large group of angry creditors. It's official, Horace Delaney left all of his assets to his son and nothing to his daughter, a move that gets Thorn Geary quite heated. Be sure of this Delaney, that legacy is your death sentence, he threatens before storming out. Atticus later confirms to Delaney that Geary was the man who came wanting to have his father murdered. Even though he doesn't inherit his father's debts, Delaney dumps out the exact amount that his old man owed. As a line for payment forms, a young lady approaches, claiming that what she deserves isn't on the table. He owed me all that is due from a husband to a wife, she announces, revealing that her name is Lorna Delaney, previously Lorna Bao, a name that Delaney recalls from a playbill that he had found at his father's home. The mysterious actress has a document that proves she was married to the elder Delaney two years earlier in Ireland. Rightfully suspicious, Thoit and Delaney pepper her with questions, in particular about the man's fragile mental state. Love is a kind of madness, she responds. While this matter gets sorted out, Thoit recommends that the two stay away from each other. Well, I have no love for the theater, cracks Delaney. And I spend very little time in German brothels, she quips. I think we've got some chemistry here. For a strange man, Delaney sure seems to vibe with a lot of women, even if they are his sister, a prostitute, and his stepmother. Speaking of his appeal to women, Delaney decides to take a night out at a concert. No, he's not shockingly a fan of music, instead, he's there to see his sister. Not one for a scene, she heads outside for a one-on-one. -on -one. He continues to express his feelings, admitting that he missed her. You used to straighten your skirts and march away like nothing happened, he says. Who marched away? She asks. And thank God you did. Clearly disturbed by the rumors, she wants to know if he really ate flesh. He agrees to tell her everything if she leaves with him, a request she doesn't accept. On his way home, a woman is following Delaney. Could it be that Zilpha changed her mind? Nope, definitely isn't as Delaney and the woman walk by and stab each other. 
Gutting them with a blade wasn't enough for Delaney, who then took a bite out of their neck. Turns out that it wasn't a woman, it was the illustrious Silver Tooth Man. Delaney may have finally killed him, but he hasn't gotten out unscathed. He falls to the ground with a blade stuck in him. As he bleeds out and has flashbacks to Africa, he passes out alone on the dark street. Episode 3 begins with another woman in Delaney's life, well one and a half. Helga's maybe daughter Winter is among a group of children to discover the body of the silver tooth man, who had been posing as a female when he attacked Delaney. Winter, appearing to be the group's ringleader, orders a boy to remove the man's tooth. Meanwhile, it is revealed that Delaney is alive, for now. He's in severe pain, often violently shaking, and being stitched up by Dumbarton. The doctor isn't just being a good Samaritan, he has his patient tied up and interrogates him about what he wants. Turns out nothing crazy, just wanted to send a message to Thomas Jefferson and the President of the United States. Carlsbad said, you know Delaney might just be crazy enough to take us all on. The King, the Company, and the Free Fifteen, shared Dumbarton. Well, maybe she was right. Based on what we've seen of Delaney, Carlsbad was definitely right. Delaney doesn't want money for his father's land, he will give Nootka to whichever nation gives him a trade monopoly of tea. All the tea in China, he says. You should have said that from the start, admits Dumbarton. Would have saved yourself a lot of pain. The interrogation wasn't all good for the doctor, he unknowingly gave Delaney one piece of information that he didn't have, Carlsbad is a woman. Now stitched up and alive if not still in extreme pain, Delaney has some business to handle. As usual, upon returning home, he gets a lecture from Brace. For what do you risk your life? The servant asks. After a little rest, the duo heads to the docks to meet Atticus. Unsurprisingly, he's the man to turn to for weaponry. The news of the Silver Tooth Man's death has spread, prompting Atticus to try and give Delaney advice on what is the best part of a man to eat. Come on Atticus, that's like telling Michael Jordan how to dunk. Refusing to leave London for his own safety, Delaney orders Brace to deliver a letter to the king and Atticus to take him into the city. He's not making a food run, he's headed to see Thoit to craft a will. No, he didn't decide to leave everything to his dear sister, instead in the event of his death, his land and possessions go to the US government. So now we know the savage boy is cunning, says Stuart Strange, noting that now they not only can't kill him, but it's also in their best interest to keep him alive. Just because the British have the incentive for him to live doesn't mean Delaney isn't still going into full lockdown mode. The house is being boarded up and he decides to take inventory of the rest of his father's home. He heads down to the flooded basement, where once again winter appears out of nowhere. Not an ideal time for the young girl to show up since Delaney is in danger and wearing no pants. In a very considerate move, she offers up the silver tooth, although he insists she keeps it, and goes back to Helga's. The Delaney family home adventures continue with a stop in a woman's room that seems to not have been touched in years. Sitting in front of the boarded up fireplace, Delaney has more of his troubling visions, seeing the same mysterious female figure. He proceeds to open up the fireplace and notices a symbol on the wall. When Brace enters, he questions him about the mark, sharing that it's the same symbol that was tattooed on him when he was a prisoner in Africa. You don't speak, but you do have answers, he tells his loyal servant. And you will give me answers. The next scene features Delaney visiting his mother's grave, begging the question, is she the woman from his visions? The old expression, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, gets put to the test as the king's go-to man Coop meets with Strange. The company and the government aren't in a good place right now as they're presently engaged in a standoff regarding India. Coop reveals that he received a letter from Delaney saying that he will give Nootka to the British if they give him a monopoly on the trade of sea otter pelts, an offer that would damage the company. Knowing this, Coop attempts to use this as leverage to settle the India dispute. Strange is enraged, telling Coop that this is all about revenge. What the hell did you do to him Stuart? Asks Coop, seeming as if he already knows the answer. In a classic Delaney move, Coop immediately heads off for another important meeting. He attends Lorna's show, making sure that she gets a message from him. Speaking of going to see a performance, Delaney makes an unexpected appearance at a brothel full of men dressed up as women. He spots a familiar face, who rightfully runs away when he's noticed. Tracking the man down, Delaney quips, you haven't changed a bit. 
It turns out that the man is Godfrey, an employee at the East India Company who keeps the minutes of the meetings and happens to be a former classmate of Delaney. He wants his friend to feed him information on the company. Delaney shows a surprisingly tender side until he puts money on the nightstand and immediately wants Godfrey to share intel. Not much time has passed throughout the first two and a half episodes, but the timeline gets sped up a bit during a montage of Delaney and Zilpha trading letters back and forth. As Delaney prepares his ship and business dealings, he writes to his sister telling her that they can leave once the company has fallen. She replies that she wants no part of his future. But we are the future, he responds. As she insists that he stop writing her, he continues, your husband is also a fool. He cannot see all that you are. After she says that any future letters will be burned, he declares, then, I will visit you in your dreams, my love. In the final message of the exchange, Zilpha begs, please, I'm your sister, let all else lie. From one important woman in Delaney's life to another, he returns home to find Lorna trying to move herself in. Her top lawyer has drawn up a document, with the help of the government, giving her claim to half of the late Delaney's possessions. My servant wants to shoot you in the face, Delaney says. Your servant is also now half mine, she deadpans. I'm still smelling some chemistry. She offers to relinquish her claim on Nutka for his part of the house. Beginning to have more visions, he snaps back into reality and barks for Brace to set up his mother's room for Lorna. She will stay with them until the business is settled, but he warns that having caught the attention of the king has put her in danger. After interactions with two women whom he clearly has some history or chemistry with, Delaney gets a surprise visit from someone with whom he has neither, Thorn Geary. His brother-in-law's rival stops by under the pretense of offering ship insurance, but his real intentions quickly become clear. Turning back from leaving, a dark smile comes across his face and he decides to stay for the weirdest family conversation ever. He begins taunting Delaney about his sex life, which he says has improved since his wife's brother returned. Since you've come back, our fucking has almost become murderous. As Delaney sits there silently stirring, Geary continues his perverse talk. I didn't come to sell you insurance, Mr. Delaney. I came to thank you. Well, Delaney soon has something to be thankful for himself. Zilpha has summoned him to an empty church. I used to think we were the same person, she admits. We are, he replies. Insisting they aren't, Zilpha moves from the booth across from her brother and sits on his lap. They briefly kiss, before she gets up, lifting her skirt as she walks away, a callback to the last episode when Delaney says she used to lift her skirt and walk away like nothing happened. Now, I never want to see you again, she states. Always persistent, her brother insists she will. Returning home, Zilpha is sitting down for a tense dinner with her husband. He went through her clothes and saw blood, indicating that they wouldn't be having a child anytime soon. My dearest Zilpha, I but apologize that I'm not related to you. His berating of his wife is interrupted by their servant returning with oranges that Zilpha had requested. Geary yells that she doesn't want them. We all know what she wants. What she supposedly wants is currently engaged in a strange threes company reboot. Brace, Lorna, and Delaney are all hanging around their shared house until she insists that she must leave to go perform. Initially resisting, Delaney allows it, deciding that he will take in some theater. Facing a feisty crowd, Lorna storms off the stage, while at the same time, Delaney notices a woman exiting the crowd. Looking flustered, Lorna begins heading home, only to be offered a ride by the woman, who claims to be a fan. Appearing to be a fan of more than Lorna's acting, the woman kisses her and reveals that a powerful man has paid to watch them together. When the carriage stops, the man grabs Lorna and she in turn cuts him. With perfect timing, Delaney shows up with a gun, ordering them to leave her be. That bitch is dead, declares the man. Once in the clear, Delaney insists that she leave for Paris until things are settled. She refuses, instead heading home to her chilled room. While Delaney speculates on who knew that she was staying with them, he comes to the conclusion that the government and company will be coming for her. Taboo's fourth chapter begins with Delaney doing typical Delaney things. He's sitting pantless in front of his fireplace and having visions of floating in water. He's snapped out of it by government soldiers banging down the front door. As Delaney predicted, they've come for Lorna. Before they can get to her, Delaney takes her aside to tell her that she must hold out. 
Easier said than done as she's taken to a dark, disgusting prison and brought to face co-op. The king's right-hand man isn't there to play good cop. He begins slowly pulling her dress off as he tells her what she must do to avoid being hung for attempted murder. A key and a pen are your only weapons, he tells her, trying to force her into signing over her claim on Nutka to the government. I've been told to await a better offer, she replies. Coop's interrogation only promises to get more violent and appalling when company men prove to have perfect timing, arranging for her immediate release. We had a fucking agreement. Yells a pissed off strange upon learning that Coop's proposed deal with Lorna would have given Nutka to only the government, leaving the company in the cold. This revelation causes him to proclaim that they will withdraw from negotiations regarding India. Seen but not heard during Strange's rant is Godfrey, Delaney's inside man. Not long after the meeting, Godfrey, now donning his nighttime wear, is feeding info to his former classmate. They plan to reject Delaney's proposed offer, while also blackballing him from trading for what he really needs, gunpowder. They can't kill you. But they will crucify your name, Godfrey says tenderly, rubbing Delaney's hand. They will crucify all those around you. Pulling away, Delaney replies, but I don't keep anybody around me who doesn't deserve what they get. Burn on Godfrey. Not the way to treat your confidential informant. If it weren't already hard enough to keep up with the names of the white British characters Taboo already has, we are introduced to Chumley, who is teaching chemistry to a group of women, and Delaney, which is weird considering the chemistry that he always seems to have with women. One of Chumley's students stays after class for some sex education, a lesson that abruptly ends when Delaney makes his presence known. I have a use for you, declares Delaney. Then like new acquaintances do, they have a little chemistry and semen talk, with Cole's services being locked down with a bag of gold. Upon returning home, Delaney has some explaining to do to Lorna. You said I was a weakness, she says. I wasn't weak. He still thinks she should leave, but if she stays, then he may have a use for her in his new crew, the League of the Damned. We are the ships, you are the river, quips Lorna. Delaney's art of chemistry continues in a strange, unnerving scene. Sitting in front of his fire like he often does, he starts doing a ritual, another thing he often does. But this time, it somehow is affecting his sister, who while lying in bed at home becomes overtaken by pleasure. While Delaney throws dirt on his face and appears to be drinking blood, Zilpha is moaning and having her body move around like she's in The Exorcist. The invasion of Zilpha's body by her brother comes to an end just in time for another man in her life to take advantage of her. Returning home drunk, Thorne can tell that she's been thinking of Delaney. Who's in there? He asks, moving his hand up her nightgown. Where he leads, I will follow. Against her wishes, he takes off his clothes and climbs on top of her. Having become fast friends, Delaney and Coleman meet up at Delaney's new factory, which happens to be the farm of the man housing his secret brother. It was a late night for Coleman, who is still feeling the effects of laughing gas from a party, but he soldiers on, investigating the cow and pigeon excrement on the property. Knowing that he needs to find a way to get gunpowder, Delaney hopes that Coleman can help him make his own. After initially saying the process would take one year, the chemistry expert revealed that refined saltpeter could shorten the process to four weeks. The only problem is that it can only be found in Burma or the warehouse of the East India Company, and they sure aren't going to do Delaney any favors. Hiring Coleman, Delaney vows to get him the ingredients. Now alone, Delaney's departure is delayed by his horse appearing spooked, which leads him to take a look around. The tension is palpable as he slowly moves around, noticing nothing, until he's blindsided by a monster of a man. Delaney gets thrown around, and the mammoth seems to have scored the knockout punch with a crack to the head. He begins to drag a bleeding and knocked out Delaney, but he isn't quite down for the count and pulls out a knife and starts stabbing the man. And Delaney won't let him get away that easy, he puts hooks in him and drags the man, basically crucifying him. Walking away covered in blood, he catches a glimpse of the young boy watching. That's going to give him nightmares, but that does run in the family. The Three's Company reboot continues at the Delaney house. Today, the breakfast topic is two letters Delaney received. The first is an invitation to a ball hosted by the mysterious Countess Musgrove and the second is from the Americans. With no specification on what kind of ball it is, Delaney decides to turn it into a stepmother-son dance and invites Lorna to join him. 
Before he parties with members of high society, he has some less distinguished people to visit. Step 1 is to see Helga, booking her and some of her girls for the night. Next up is Atticus. I wish I could tell you fully what they were discussing, but I could only understand about one of every four words that Atticus said. What is clear is that they're planning a robbery. After scouting out the company's docks, Delaney gets a bag from Chumley. It's ball time. Not once to make a quiet arrival, Delaney and Lorna draw many eyes upon their entrance. Judging by the horror on the faces of the ladies, you're known, she teases. And yes, judging by the shame on the face of some of the men, so are you, he retorts. Dodging one familiar face in Chumley's back on that laughing gas, Delaney tracks down his sister, who made a quick exit upon seeing him. Believing it was no coincidence that they were both invited, he tells Zilpha that the Americans must know their secret. You feel me and I could come more often, but I spare you, he says, referring to his creepy ritual that violated her. Then spare me, she replies, noting that she visited a doctor who told her that he visits as animals. Initially, believing he was crazy when he left England, Delaney views the power as a gift. It's the devil, she differs. Dumbarton comes in and ruins the moment, which causes an embarrassed Zilpha to run off. The Americans are the ones who sent that man to kill Delaney. Impressed and maybe nervous, they have decided to up their offer. They are willing to throw Zilpha into the deal, which would give them a life of anonymity together. While he's being offered the woman he loves, another key element of Delaney's plan is being executed. Thanks to Helga, her girls, Atticus, and Chumley's chemistry project, the break-in of the company's warehouse was successful, making out with loads of saltpeter. Back at the ball, all the key players are present, Delaney, Lorna, Zilpha, Chumley, and Geary. This provides the first opportunity for Lorna to meet her other stepchild and possible romantic rival. Bathroom girl talk gets taken to a weird and uncomfortable level as the two play coy about their respective relationships with Delaney. If I were to have intentions regarding James, would I have to be wary of you? Asks Lorna. No civilized woman would have intentions regarding him, replies Zilpha, who upon leaving reveals that she is in fact his sister. Meanwhile, if Delaney didn't have enough women troubles, another one comes into his life, Countess Musgrave, aka Carlsbad. Now that everyone has had time to get acquainted and have a productive evening, it's time for the face-off that has been four episodes in the making. A drunk Geary spots Delaney, approaches him, and screams about his relationship with Zilpha. Delaney punches him and drags his brother-in-law outside before the secret totally comes out. The whole party follows, waiting to see what the crazed man could do. Zilpha begs her brother to stop. The fact that she called him James only infuriates Geary more. You fucked her, he yells at Delaney. And you lay your hands on me in my society. And now I will have my satisfaction. He then proceeds to challenge him to a duel to the death, leaving the crowd shocked and Zilpha horrified. Do you accept? Geary demands to know. Not usually one to avoid a fight, Delaney is silent as the episode ends. Episode 4 begins with Geary's challenge of a duel to the death with Delaney. It is not a show to rob us of a duel, episode 5 begins shortly after the previous installment. Separately, Geary and Delaney are being rowed to a small remote body of land for their showdown. A crowd of onlookers, including Lorna, await the battle. Thoit makes his reappearance, serving as a representative for the proceedings. As both men's pistols are inspected, Geary introduces his second, Mr. Hope, while Delaney declines to have one. Not enjoying her view from afar, Lorna walks up from the water. I was bored, and I've never seen a man shot, she quips before being named her stepson second. They will duel to first blood, Rambo style, even though Geary prefers it to be to the death. No second shot will be allowed, so once you've fired, you better have killed your opponent or consider yourself killed. The men make their approach, but Delaney doesn't raise his gun, which gives Geary a clean shot at his brother-in-law's heart. One problem, there was no bullet. A terrified and shocked Geary looks as Delaney wipes the dust off his jacket and moves closer to raise his gun. Satisfied? Asks Delaney. My apologies, that was an excellent shot. I can only assume that your second is a company man since he failed to load a ball in your pistol. At this moment, Mr. Hope makes a run for it, but he doesn't get far before Delaney shoots him. It would appear that my life is more precious than yours, 
gloats Delaney. He walks away as his brother-in-law's rival is left trembling. Not faring much better is Zilpha, who is at home awaiting word if it will be her husband or brother killed. Upon seeing Giri, a sense of relief comes over her, but it's quickly replaced with a look of grief. She hugs her husband when he walks in, only for him to be disgusted by the ash that she's covered in from cleaning the fireplace. Instead of telling her what happened, Giri chugs a bottle of alcohol and evades her questions, he says he doesn't need to tell her since all of London will be talking about it. So I shall hear through gossip. She asks. As I hear about you, he quickly retorts. Damn, he's a jerk, but that was a great comeback. So how was the party? Brace, unaware of the late night shenanigans, asks Lorna and Delaney. It was entertaining, replies Lorna. You have to enjoy this quirky threes company reboot. Even though he wasn't fully keyed in on the saltpeter robbery, Brace seems to always know what's going on, he reveals that soldiers were running up and down streets while insisting that the guilty parties will hang. At the shore away from Brace, Delaney tells Lorna not to worry about being hanged because only the government can order that and they would likely want to make a deal. Look, I'm very happy to admit that I don't want James Delaney to die, she says. But can you also admit that you don't want James Delaney to die? He doesn't admit that, but he does remind her to get his father's chest. Once he departs, the always sneaky winter suddenly appears, she tells Lorna she doesn't want Delaney to die either. They say he's the devil, but not to me, Winter says. Alright, what's with her obsession with him? Considering Helga and Delaney's past, could he be Winter's father? So many possible illegitimate children. As the soldiers tear apart London and Delaney's warehouse looking for the saltpeter, Delaney enjoys a nice horse ride through the hills. Another man is not far behind, so Delaney decides to introduce himself. He sneaks up on the man, slashes him across the stomach, and leaves him alive as a warning to others. Undeterred, Delaney continues his journey to his newly created factory to check on Chumley's progress. But all Chumley can think about is Lorna. Not only is she among the large number of women that I would sleep with, but she's among the much smaller group of women I would masturbate over, he says, clearly not knowing how to talk to a man about his stepmother. Delaney doesn't permit Chumley to call upon Lorna, so the scientist instead asks for an assistant. On the same property, Delaney goes to see the landowner and young boy, who may or may not be his brother or son. Delaney won't let the boy, he tells him all about the stolen saltpeter and says that any conspirators will be hanged. So, you are now one of us, he says to the boy, who is then taken over to be Chumley's apprentice, a role sure to be interesting. The next stop for Delaney is to pay a visit to Atticus and his men. The problem is though, that Delaney sniffs a rat. Well, someone is thinking about taking the company's reward for information. Out of nowhere, Delaney slices one man's thumb off. I am inside your heads, gentlemen, he declares. Always. Finally, Delaney makes his way to see Helga and her girls. He's a little more polite in his conversation with them, but he still makes sure to get his point across, by pulling out his newly acquired appendage. If any company men come asking around, they are to notify him. Such a situation soon arises, with Winter summoning Atticus to handle it. The man is killed and dumped by the water, and Atticus has Winter spread word that it was done by, the devil Delaney. Before doing so, she leaves a note on the body that reads, died on company business, complete with the familiar bird symbol. Delaney takes a short nightmare break, it's time for another ritual. Here he blows dust, which prompts visions of him painted in white in the water. Thinking he has heard an explosion, he immediately heads to the factory, where everything is fine. Chumley and his new pupil are still hard at work. Having perfected the crazy, scary stare, Delaney uses it on the kid. What do you see? The man asks him. I see a psycho, but the boy doesn't answer. He's just scared of you, pipes in Chumley. Everybody's scared of you. Thankfully. But Lorna's not scared of him. She's brought her deceased husband's trunk. As he goes through it, Delaney throws everything in the fire, a move that doesn't sit well with Lorna. She thinks he should read his father's letters to him, but he's more concerned with finding the treaty that showed how his father bought Nutka, which he does. Meanwhile, the King and Coop are discussing the option of prosecuting the company for negligence because of the stolen saltpeter. While Coop likes the idea, he has a way to hit Strange directly, 
and he puts the plan into motion by summoning George Chichester. He's a black man working for the Sons of Africa. For the past nine years, he's been trying to get the Crown to look into the sinking of the Influence, a slave ship that saw the death of 280 people. Chichester believes that senior directors at the East India Company were involved, which explains Coop's sudden interest. It's taken way too long, but the King finally commissions an investigation, and Strange doesn't handle the news too well. He tells Wilton to offer full cooperation, before adding, and then, I will tell you which papers to burn. Rumors of Delaney's involvement in the saltpeter theft have spread, so he gets called before Dumbarton. The Americans need gunpowder, and Chumley and Delaney have eight days to make it or else. With a tight schedule, the doctor suggests that they utilize the French experiment. Chumley's familiarization with the option is exactly why he refuses to do it. He believes it's too risky, and he dares to ask if Delaney would risk his son's life for this. Oh, snap. Delaney doesn't deny that accusation. Called it. Delaney does promise to get Chumley his men needed for the experiment, though. Zilpha is sleeping and making noises, I'm worried we'll get a repeat of her brother invading her with his creepy ritual. But no, he's not forcing anything, she just happens to be dreaming about him and moaning his name. To no surprise, seeing this doesn't sit well with Geary. You said his name, he says repeatedly. Get him out. As he begins to violently shake her, she spits in his face. They trade slaps before Geary pulls his wife down to the floor and hits her multiple times. As he holds her down, he declares, you need a priest, my dear. After meeting the mysterious Carlsbad last episode, we get a more proper introduction here. Delaney visits her while she's eating dinner with her much older husband. To let her know she'll need to get the gunpowder. Even though she plays it off, it's clear that she doesn't know about Dumbarton's request. Although she has given her recommendation that the US government accept his offer, he must sign the treaty before leaving London. After, Brace and Delaney have one of their classic conversations where they say a lot by saying nothing. Lorna then interrupts to complain about how cold her room is. This is the Delaney household, we have no warmth here, quips Delaney, busting out a rare joke. He then turns his attention to persuading his stepmother from reciprocating Chumley's advances, a request that she doesn't dispute. Delaney just can't help from keeping all the men and women to himself. Beaten and bruised, Zilpha emerges from her room. Already on edge, she's further spooked when Geary reveals that he followed up on his declaration that she needed a priest. He's brought in a man who specializes in getting rid of demons by performing exorcisms. Goodness, a slight thing she is, but fearful, assesses the holy man. They strap her down for the procedure, which for some reason includes the priest rubbing and grabbing her breasts a lot. I'm no expert, but that doesn't seem like part of the process. Zilpha cries and screams then goes quiet. Geary unties her and then tells her to meet him in bed. Once he leaves, Zilpha slowly gets a haunted look on her face. Teach me, she whispers. The vibe she's giving off is very similar to the one Delaney does during his rituals. After making her way to their bedroom, Zilpha pulls a sharp instrument from a desk. She runs it through her hand and quietly says, guide me. Oh yeah, she's definitely possessed now. Before we get to the shocking end, let's rewind to the start. Even though we've never met her, Delaney's late mother has been one of Taboo's most important figures. Her memory and her death drive and haunts him. As the troubled man continues to have visions, presumably of his mother, Brace reveals that Delaney doesn't know everything about her. The servant tells a story of Delaney's mother bringing her son to a lake to drown him, a move that resulted in her being hospitalized. She wanted you dead, James, Brace admits. This new intel only adds to Delaney's visions, with a baby falling to the bottom of the water now thrown in for good measure. Storytime with Brace inspires Delaney to visit his mother's grave at the abandoned Bethlehem Royal Hospital. Complete with chains on the beds, it doesn't look like a pleasant place. He begins to hear voices as he walks around the building, which isn't a surprise since he seems to hear voices everywhere. Delaney, who clearly has an affinity for water, be it in visions or real life, heads to the docks. As always, Winter makes a surprise appearance, prompting Delaney to recite the show's most used line, Go away, Winter. The young girl continues to remind the madman that she's not afraid of him, prompting him to ask what she is afraid of. Of who they say you are, the African devil, she responds. 
He then speaks an African language to her, making her immediately reconsider her whole position. Stop staring, you're scaring me, she declares. Continuing his journey through bodies of water, Delaney decides to take a quick dip in the area, which looks very similar to his visions. As he goes underwater, seeming to drown himself, he has flashbacks to the incident from his childhood. Finally popping up, he spots Robert, who instantly runs away. George Chichester's investigation has already begun to send panic through the EIC office. He's African, they smell fear like dogs, quips Pettifer. They're definitely intimidated by the black cannonball, and their worry only increases when Chichester stops by for an update. While many know the sunken ship as the influence, its original name was the Cornwallis, a name that was changed when the ship began to carry slaves. The new information doesn't sit well with Strange, especially when he's told that Chichester brought up Strange's brother, a plantation owner. Tired of being outmaneuvered, the company man compares the situation to a game of chess. I think it's time we start moving some pieces, he confidently states. Business is booming at the Delaney factory, well, luckily not literally. The extra men brought in by Delaney have proved to be very useful but also very alarming, at least in the eyes of Ibbotson, the land's owner. He makes multiple impromptu stops to check in, and he doesn't appear to like what he's seeing. Delaney hasn't been home in a while, both depriving us of our favorite Threes Company reboot and worrying Lorna. He won't be dead and he won't be happy, you can depend on that, Brace tells her, not easing her concerns. Her unease inspires her to make a house call to her stepdaughter's rival. Unfortunately, a drunk and jobless even bragging about it Geary greets her. Probably not one who should speak about rumors, he teases Lorna about the stories going around about her and Delaney. An actress who enjoys walking with a man with human flesh in his teeth, he says. Soon, a beaten and bruised Zilpha walks in, not showing signs of the haunted persona she gave off at the end of the last episode. Geary continues to taunt Lorna, singing a song that he insists is being sung in the streets about Delaney. Lorna counters that people were singing that long before her stepson returned. Before Mr. Delaney returned to London, Geary responded. Oh yes, the golden age. Zilpha has had enough, telling Lorna that they can't help and she should leave. She even refuses to call her a carriage. As much as Hardy gets credit for his facial expressions, Buna Chaplin deserves some kudos for her range of crazy looks. It's time to deliver the gunpowder to the Americans. The plan is to transfer the product in caskets, with the victims having died of cholera, a cover story they hope will keep curious eyes at bay. Before the mission begins, Delaney pulls Robert aside, confronting the young boy about what he saw by the pond. Robert, who appears to have the family gene of being quiet, stands up well to questioning. The outlaws then set off, donning clothes over their faces that both sell the cholera story and make them look pretty badass. Everything is going smoothly until they are pulled over by soldiers, who, despite the virus warning, want to look inside the caskets. Delaney and Chumley think the jig is up, but Robert shows his worth, playing dead when one of the soldiers takes a peek. The mission is soon completed, leaving Dumbarton pleased with Delaney, or, as he calls him, an extraordinary discovery. Delaney is glad to hear how pleased the doctor is since he wants safe passage for his ship in return. Finally, Delaney returns home, which means one thing, wacky hijinks and comedy. As soon as Delaney kicks off his boots, brace cracks, you stink of cow shit. Delaney quickly replies, it's horse shit, actually. The good times continue in the Delaney household. Lorna then does what any good stepmother or potential love interest would do, she shares with Delaney her concern for his life. Telling him of her day looking for him and the rumors she hears, Lorna says she believes he needs to stop relying on the king to protect him. It's a really heartfelt message from Lorna, but Delaney can only hear one thing. What did my sister say? He asks. Speaking of Zilpha, she might not have had much to say earlier, but she's up to stuff now. We find her recreating the end of the last episode, rubbing a sharp object in the dark as Geary sleeps. This time, she does more than play with the object. Sitting on top of her husband, Zilpha pulls up his shirt, looking for the perfect spot on his body. Then, just as he awakens, she pushes it through his gut as an evil look comes over her face. After little time or struggle, Geary lays motionless. While her husband's body is still warm, Zilpha braves the rain in the middle of the night to see her brother. 
Her arrival confuses him, a feeling that's only enhanced when she hugs him. What have you done? He asks. She chillingly responds, I killed him, just like you said. I don't think this is quite what he intended when he started visiting her. The news throws him, especially the part about him telling her to do it, something he begins to ask about, but he stops himself. He'll do what any great brother or lover would, dispose of the body. And by the time it's morning, he'll have a carriage bring her home. This part of the plan doesn't sit well with Zilpha, until he explains that it's to avoid questions. Creating a cholera panic already helped with the gunpowder transfer, so Delaney goes back to that well again. As they don masks, Dumbarton and a nurse go to the morgue to look over Geary's body. The doctor puts a cholera warning tag on the dead man and orders an immediate burial. Strange and the EIC haven't had many things to be excited about since Delaney's return to London, but that's about to change. The episode's focus on the old man at the factory wasn't for nothing, he confessed his sins to a priest and shared the news of the activity on his land. The information is met with universal praise at the EIC, well, besides Godfrey. In full panic, Godfrey runs to Delaney's house to warn him. Not very thankful, Delaney sends his informant away and goes to see Chumley. The scientist explains that moving the current supply of gunpowder is impossible, as it's too explosive to transport on bumpy roads. Not wanting any excuses, Delaney literally gives Chumley a heart for some courage. It's the heart of the old man, who was killed and left in the church where he confessed. That sudden motivation gives Chumley an idea. To the water, Delaney's favorite place, it is. The men make away with the product on rowboats as the soldiers arrive at an empty building. I told you that strange happiness would be short-lived. Upon being informed by Wilton of the failed seizure, the big boss comes up with a new plan. We will allow him to think he's one step ahead, while we exploit what is undefended, declares Strange. Zilpha is in true Ice Queen mode as she prepares for her husband's funeral. Delaney shows up but does not pay his respects, instead opting to dig the grave and then watch from a distance as he drinks liquor victory champagne. After the burial, the siblings are the only ones left, staring at each other from afar. Then, in an extremely romantic gesture, Delaney rides to his sister's house, marches right into her bedroom, and barks, take that fucking dress off, now. It's a little aggressive, especially on Valentine's Day, but the move works as they immediately begin having sex. The passion is off the charts until those pesky visions happen again. Nothing is worse than when you're having sex with your sister and you can't stop thinking about your scary dead mom, am I right? It becomes too much for Delaney, causing him to retreat and seek privacy at his mother's abandoned hospital, where the gunpowder is now being stored. Not quite the ending to the night he probably imagined. Now that Zilpha is presumably back in his life, the next morning, Delaney goes to the second most important thing in his life, his new ship. Making his way there, he's greeted by Wilton, who has a message from his boss. It's war, he says. The gloves are off. The man isn't joking, considering that moments later, the ship explodes. Looking on as his prized possession bursts into flames, Delaney is truly shocked. Having long acted untouchable, he is paying the price. This unexpected development sends Delaney into a fit of rage that scares his associates, whom he rushes to visit. First up is Godfrey. Delaney is none too happy that his inside man didn't give him a heads up, though Godfrey notes that he wasn't aware. Next up is Atticus. Delaney seeks out his intimidating friend for two reasons, he needs help finding a new ship and insurance so that no one else betrays him. Atticus has no problem assisting with the second matter, approaching the man whose thumb Delaney previously sliced off. As the man is distracted, Delaney sneaks up and kills him, even gutting him. The fact that this man turned out to be the traitor makes Atticus curious how Delaney knew it would happen, concluding it must be either reason or witchcraft. Always a good friend except for Godfrey, Delaney allows Atticus to keep the heart. It's pretty hard to scare a man with a head tattoo, but Delaney has accomplished it, as Atticus lets out a sigh of relief when the crazed man leaves. A drunk Delaney then stops by Helga's brothel, asking for just a slight favor. Maybe joking, maybe not, he recommends that she kill a captain for him so he can take that man's ship. She's not a fan of that plan, so he heads out, taking another bottle with him. Where would a miserable and intoxicated Delaney go? The water, of course. 
Taking a dip once again, Delaney is interrupted by, you guessed it, Winter. This girl legit must just follow him around waiting for the best time to start a convo. Initially ordering her to leave because he's busy and not fit to be near her, Delaney changes his tune when she gives him some more liquor. Next thing we know, it's morning, and Delaney must have had quite the alcohol-fueled evening. He wakes up face down in the mud, still at the docks. As he stands up and tries to get his bearings, he notices something by the water and moves closer. It's winter, and she's dead. And not just regular dead, like, missing flesh, Delaney victim type dead. Well, Delaney's plan isn't really working out as he planned, or is it? With only one episode remaining in the season, Taboo's penultimate episode left us with many questions, but for once, it also gave us some answers. In a non-shocking development, it seems that Delaney didn't kill Winter, and in a shocking reveal, Horace Delaney's death was a mercy kill by Brace. Episode 7 starts with Winter's memorial. Helga and Atticus are among those gathered to say their final goodbyes to the young girl while Delaney silently watches from afar. After Chumley drops off Robert at the Delaney household, Lorna goes to see Delaney, who is still observing the waterside funeral. You have a heart at least, she tells him. He insists that he's only down by the water to look for a ship. Responding to her belief that he didn't kill Winter, he says, I very well may have. Once Delaney finally leaves, Lorna tries to talk to one of Winter's young friends, who runs off when she approaches him. Throughout the early run of the series, Atticus and Helga don't interact much, but unfortunately, these two dynamic characters are brought together under somber circumstances, rowing Winter's body out to be dumped in the water. While Helga is concerned that the body won't sink, Atticus eases her worry by pointing out that he would definitely know the best way to make someone disappear. The river will only take her body, I will keep her soul, says Helga, clearly emotionally broken over the loss of her daughter. Looking uneasy, Atticus half-heartedly tries to suggest that it's possible Delaney didn't do it. There's no certainty that he did not, she quickly replies. Yeah, she's definitely pissed. Delaney awakens to see Winter in his house, telling him, I'm getting scared, James. Not one to be thrown off by spiritual visitors, Delaney does have an important question. You're among them now, aren't you? He asks. The ones who used to sing to me. For his and our own curiosity, Delaney then begins to ask if he killed her, but Winter disappears before he can. As one ghost visitor leaves, a real visitor arrives, maybe. When Chichester shows up, Delaney rightfully asks, and I need to be clear, you're not a spirit like the others. Both men have heard a lot about each other, and they immediately have a great rapport. After a little fun, Chichester gets down to business, he knows that Delaney was on the Cornwallis when it sunk. Delaney doesn't deny that fact, but he also doesn't give any real answers, maybe partly because he's drunk. This leads Chichester to recommend he come back another time. No, no, there's no use. I'm always like this, Delaney replies, speaking the truth. Chichester knows things. He has a great deal of knowledge of Delaney's past, including his rise from to slave to a slaver to stealing diamonds from a fellow slaver. I have done much worse things than steal diamonds, Delaney divulges, the opposite of breaking news. Chichester wants Delaney to confess that Strange was behind the Cornwallis, and in exchange, he will be given a royal pardon. I have an alternative suggestion, Delaney mysteriously counters. Pondering his situation, Delaney gets a visit from Robert. I'm not sure what parenting books Delaney has read because it seems like all he ever does is give the kid crazy, scary looks. I have a use for you, Delaney tells Robert. He gives him the key to his safe, but not before playing an uncharacteristic game of keep away. Taking a stroll down the street, most likely to run errands, since that's kind of his thing, Delaney is fired upon. A bullet knocks over his hat. Murderer, Helga yells. She fires again, but, either because she doesn't truly want to kill him or because she's a bad shot, this one hits the ground. Staring at the grieving mother, Delaney picks up his hat and walks away. The lioness will fearlessly protect her cubs, regardless of the consequences, even if that means her certain death, Delaney later tells Atticus. His associate is quite worried about Helga's outburst, but Delaney orders that she not be touched. She is harmed enough already, he declares, noting that it's inevitable that she will go to the company with what she knows. 
Delaney's problems with women don't get any better when he gets a visit from his sister. We last left them having sex, only for their lovemaking to be interrupted by Delaney's crazy visions, you know, the usual. With Geary out and creepy voices in, Zilpha is ready to be with Delaney. The problem is, that Delaney has had a change of heart. I believed once that we were the same person, he shares, hearkening back to a time, like, four episodes ago. She interrupts, we are. This is quite the role reversal. We aren't, he retorts. Not anymore. If rejecting her weren't already bad enough, he throws her a pity diamond for her widowhood. She begins moaning, but these are much sadder moans than their previous encounter. As if Delaney weren't already dealing with enough family issues, he has a moody Brace to confront. Robert and Lorna are manning the kitchen since Brace refuses to leave his room, until his longtime boss comes calling. Sitting in the dark, Delaney wants to talk to a somber Brace about the rats in the house, but really the conversation is about much more. As Delaney alludes to the large amount of arsenic that Brace purchased, tears fall down the servant's face as he plays with buttons from Horace's dress coat. It was a kindness, Brace says, admitting to poisoning Delaney's father. We couldn't go on, James. Delaney replies, but you did. Brace continues to try and justify his actions, you came back too late. For both of us. An emotional Brace is expecting the worst from his unstable master, but instead, he gets mercy and is sent to stop Lorna from destroying the kitchen. Not the hilarious threes company we've become accustomed to. Just like both Atticus and Delaney predicted, Helga has gone to the EIC talking to Strange in his inner circle, she shares details of Delaney manufacturing gunpowder for the Americans. The news is welcomed by, well, everyone except Godfrey, who is sweating up a storm. We fucking have him, laughs Strange, causing the whole room to erupt. He will be cut to pieces. They reason that they have enough to charge Delaney with treason. Happy to have gotten her revenge, Helga is ready to leave, only to face the rude awakening of being taken into custody for her part in the plan. Godfrey, never one to cover his tracks, darts through the streets to give Delaney word of Helga's confession. Not finding him at home, he tracks his friend to the woods, where he's doing the classic James, having visions and doing witchcraft. You are betrayed, Godfrey declares. I know, Delaney says, asking for the address where Helga is being kept. I have a use for you, Delaney tells his inside man. Then they ride off on a horse together, which is just teasing Godfrey too much. Ecstatic over their newfound snitch, Strange, and his men head to update Coop, who initially isn't very excited to see them. We have some rather good news for British patriots everywhere, proclaims Strange with an evil smile. Thoit, proving to be the sole lawyer in London, has been brought in to share what charging Delaney with treason means in regard to Nuka Sound. It turns out that all of his possessions would go to the government, as his family would be deemed corrupted. Very pleased with himself, Strange says it was his duty, but that doesn't mean he isn't hoping for a reward. Coop agrees to give the company the trade monopoly that Delaney had been seeking. You got lucky with a whore, quips co-op. The official green light is given for Delaney's arrest. Delaney brings a nervous Godfrey to meet with Chichester. At least they're getting together on Godfrey's home territory a brothel full of men dressed as women. I am only interested in men's minds, not clothes, says Chichester. Godfrey is rightfully on edge, considering he's about to turn on the EIC and give vital information on the sinking of the Cornwallis. Delaney speaks to the uneasy man in private, assuring him that he will never have to testify because they will have set sail long before then. You are a fool, Godfrey replies. They are going to hang you. Despite that, Godfrey agrees to tell Chichester what he wants. The victory is short-lived, as the soldiers are en route to Molly's house. As Godfrey rushes to pack, Delaney shows no urgency, it ends here. He's actually still more concerned about finding a ship than he is about avoiding capture. Godfrey is ordered to give Helga's location to Atticus, who will help him disappear. The soldiers finally descend on Delaney, taking him alive but knocking him unconscious. Walking through town, Lorna spots the young boy she tried speaking to at Winter's Memorial. The boy, no longer avoiding her, says, I want her to forgive me. Lorna rushes home looking for Delaney to tell him that it was the company who killed Winter, but all she finds is Brace, crying, scrubbing a pot so hard that his hands are bleeding. I only wished I'd killed James too, he cries. 
Give him a kind death, protect him from himself. He informs the lady of the house that Delaney has been sent to the tower, where no one will be kind enough to feed him arsenic. News of Delaney's new circumstances spreads quickly as Chumley makes a quick exit and Countess Musgrove burns incriminating papers, but Dumbarton isn't ready to leave, declaring, when my reds are red, when my whites are white, and my blues are blue, then I will clear out. Make this man president of the colonies. Upon his arrival at the tower, Delaney is beaten, stripped naked, and left in the fetal position. His treatment doesn't get any better when Coop comes seeking information. Threatening him with enough torture to hurt him but not kill him, the king's right-hand man wants names. Delaney agrees to the deal, but only if he's given a meeting with Strange. An amused Coop orders the torture to commence. The man in charge of inflicting the harm thinks it should only take an hour or two. But I'm thinking it will take much more, especially since they're waterboarding him. We all know that Delaney loves a good old-fashioned drowning. While Delaney is going through hell, Strange is off celebrating with a round of golf. His relaxing day turns bad when Chichester makes an unexpected drop-in. At first, he's cocky, but Strange's tune changes when Chichester reveals that he has a witness who isn't Delaney. A spooked Strange soon learns that it's none other than Godfrey. In an unsurprising development, Delaney is standing up pretty well to torture, aside from all of the violent shaking and visions. All he'll say is, Stuart Strange. Tired of waiting, the king finally orders a meeting between Strange and Delaney, which the company man begrudgingly attends. When he enters Delaney's cell, he sees his enemy beaten but at least now clothed. My god, look at you, says Strange. Your plan worked, you in a cell, me on a hook. Delaney lifts his head and asserts, I have a use for you. The episode begins with a much different kind of bloodshed than the violence to come. Our first victim is the person who is least involved with Delaney's plan, making the decision to end things on her own accord. As Zilpha walks through town, we hear her reading an ominous letter she has written to her brother. Travel to a place where I will be free, she writes. It is a place where I hope someday we will meet and be happy. Standing on the side of a bridge, Delaney's beloved sister and scorned lover lets her body fall, landing in the river, reminiscent of our hero's visions. While unbeknownst to him, Zilpha has just taken her last breath, Delaney is having his mysterious meeting with Strange. It's of no surprise that the company man is doing most of the talking, acknowledging that back in the day, he was looking for boys with a shadow of death around them. That explains how Delaney became a member of his regiment. But still, Strange is amazed that the deranged man has made it long enough to sit in front of him. Finally explaining how he did survive the sunken Cornwallis, Delaney reveals that an African man saved and cured him, while also showing him who he really is. The things I did in Africa make your transactions look paltry, he confesses. I witnessed and participated in the darkness that you cannot conceive. I definitely believe that. Until now, Strange has played coy, pledging not to admit any wrongdoing. That changes when Delaney slides the powerful man a letter detailing his demands. At first, Strange continues to resist, but he alters his stance as Delaney rehearses the statement that he will give to the Royal Commission. Now, seeming to have the upper hand, Delaney gives his enemy four hours to find him a ship and handle a few more crucial requests. At that moment, the clock strikes, sending both Lorna and young Robert on their own important missions. Using the key that Delaney gave him last week, Robert retrieves a bundle of letters and sets off to deliver them. Among those receiving messages, are Brace, Atticus, and Chumley, who's passed out drunk and in hiding with some lady friends. How the hell does he find me? Chumley asks Robert. He sees me in my dreams, is that it? Knowing that the best cure for a hangover is more alcohol, Chumley quickly rebounds and returns to his lab to do his magic so he can get Delaney something that goes, bang. A pissed off Strange returns to EIC, summoning Wilton and Pettifer to give them their marching orders. Step 1 is to have Pettifer retrieve the still in morning Helga. Atticus and company stop the carriage containing them, but it turns out that Pettifer is in on it. Always one for a sweet message, Atticus tells Helga that Delaney has ordered her unharmed. There's still plenty of cocks left for you to suck, he says, charming ladies everywhere. He then turns the gun on a panicked pedifer, who claims that their bosses had an agreement. Indeed there is, replies Atticus, shooting the company man in the head. 
They soon meet up with a carriage holding both Lorna and Winter's young friend. As Helga gets in, Lorna tells her what the boys saw happen to Winter, Delaney was passed out in the mud, Helga's daughter lying next to him, until a ghost came and killed her. The young boy then followed this ghost to a meeting with company men. With this business hopefully settled, Lorna returns home, where, instead of our usual threes company reboot, there's a letter waiting. Knowing that he's short on time, Strange gets an update from Wilton. His right-hand man has secured a ship, but he still has some questions, including why they are picking up supplies at an insane asylum. Because this whole thing is insane, an exasperated Strange replies. Because this day is insane. Because Delaney is insane. Because I am insane. Already annoyed enough, he's tired of Wilton, barking, just fuck off, will you? As his plan falls into place, Delaney is still in the tower, waiting to be brought in front of co-op. As he begins chanting in African, blood falls from Delaney's mouth, which leads to a seizure. A doctor begins to sew up the prisoner, telling the guards that he needs at least another 30 minutes. Countess Musgrove has been out of the fray of late, but she re-enters the picture here, we find her playing cards, drinking, and gossiping with friends. This jolly time is interrupted by Lorna, who attempts to use a code to get the Countess to talk in private. At the mention of powder, the US spy follows her visitor out of the room, only to put a knife to Lorna's throat. While she doesn't seem to be in a position of power, Lorna says she is here for a letter of safe passage, but she won't be giving the treaty in return. Instead, she resorts to blackmail, Musgrove has a leak in her organization, and Delaney will plug it in return for her assistance. The Countess asks what Lorna means to Delaney. I'm Mrs. Delaney, she responds. His wife. Musgrove asks. Lorna proudly replies, no, his mother. As Delaney is still being worked on by the doctor, he can hear Robert yelling from outside. This is clearly a sign, as Delaney declares himself ready. He's dragged in front of Coop, who demands that the prisoner name his co-conspirators. Seeing a group of ravens fly by, Delaney responds by once again speaking in African. I will squash your balls myself, threatens an unamused Coop, claiming Delaney promised to give those names. Did I? Delaney hilariously responds. I must have lied. Then, as we see a montage of the damned making their moves, Delaney tells Coop exactly how things are about to go. When morning becomes afternoon, then I will become a free man, he rightfully predicts, since of course the ravens told him. Upon his release, he gives Robert one last letter to relay. The damned have assembled at Atticus' place of business, minus their leader. It's like when the ocean's crew is waiting to see what happens to Clooney. Standing outside, Brace's face perks up when he sees a ship coming around the corner. The arrival of the vessel means it's full steam ahead, the gunpowder is being delivered, and Atticus crew clears the streets in anticipation of a showdown. Delaney's last letter was to Chichester, and the Sons of Africa lawyer is not a happy camper when he reads its contents. Outraged and confused by Delaney making a deal with Strange, Chichester storms into the company's offices, where a cocky Strange declares, the difference between Delaney and me is that I always make sure that I have one last ace to play. A damaged Delaney limps home after a long few days of torture. While the physical abuse is over, he's about to be dealt an even more emotional blow, the note from Zilpha. I'm planning to journey to heaven, it reads. Please keep some part of my soul within your own. At this moment, an excited Lorna returns home, glad to share the news of her successful encounter with Musgrove. She finds Delaney motionless, shedding a heartbreaking single tear. Up to this point, Hardy has mostly been asked to give a brooding, physical performance, but here, he does his best work on Taboo to date. If she were dead, I would know it, he tells Lorna, not willing to accept his sister's fate. I would hear her and I would feel it. Wondering how he didn't know and why she doesn't sing to him, Delaney gets quite the pep talk from his stepmother. It's a fine day to die at sea, she quips, causing him to perk up a bit. He eventually rises and heads off to handle unfinished business, but he will return for her. His last stop before America is a visit to his American friend Dumbarton, who, it turns out, isn't the patriot he claims to be. Before he gives Delaney the safe passage that he doesn't know Musgrove has already granted, the doctor needs Nootka sound to be turned over. But he doesn't want it for the Americans, he wants it for the EIC, does it even matter? Asks Dumbarton. 
No one in this city has only one master. Grabbing the pen to sign the document, Delaney slams the traitor's head into the table. I do, he boasts. The doctor isn't getting off that easy, though. Delaney hangs the man from the rafters with his head dyed blue, the treaty stapled to him and his guts torn apart. Wilton has secured the final paperwork for Delaney's ship, handing the information over to French Bill. Tell Mr. Delaney he may have won the battle, but justice will be delivered to him by the hand of God, Wilton says. These will be his last words, as Bill shoots him in the head, courtesy of Strange. On his way to see the king, a nervous coop yells, shit, over and over to himself. Not thrilled with Delaney's power play, the king had a conversation with another powerful figure, God, who told him in a dream, everyone must hang. The king declares, just fucking kill him. As Coop tries to tell him that Delaney's death will hand Nootka to the Americans, the king replies, fuck Nootka. Fuck wills. Fuck treaties. The order for Delaney's death is officially given. As Delaney's eleven brace for the soldiers coming their way, brace gets some bad news. Delaney tells his longtime servant that he won't be making the trip to America. You've always been my father's man in my father's world, Delaney confesses. You were not born for freedom. You wouldn't know what to do with it. An emotional brace begs his master to reconsider, but to no avail. The one benefit is that he's now king of the Delaney estate, so he will have plenty of rats and old chairs to himself. The soldiers have arrived and are greeted by a detonation set off by Chumley. That gives Delaney's group an early advantage before more soldiers charge through, setting off the real fight. The casualties come quickly and often, the first is poor Helga. Delaney actually seems to be the only one in his crew who doesn't take on some sort of fire, Lorna is hit by a bullet to the shoulder, Atticus takes a blow to the eye, Chumley, getting a taste of his own medicine, is thrown by an explosion. Atticus and Delaney rush to Chumley's aid, as he's been deemed necessary, considering he's a doctor. Despite a few obstacles, they make it to the ship and set sail in the nick of time. Unaware of what has taken place at the docks, a delighted strange finds his final ace, a delivery from a messenger boy, on his desk. He even boasts of heading out early for the weekend. Strange believes the delivery to be the treaty from Dumbarton, paving the way for the EIC to control Nootka and all the tea in China. And an end to this business at last, he says gleefully. As he opens it, a massive explosion wipes out Strange in his office. We discover that Brace did make it out of the battle at the docks alive. Instead of celebrating, he's back at the Delaney estate, staring off into the distance. His silence is interrupted when Chichester appears, Delaney had left word with the lawyer that he could find both his and Godfrey's statements at the house. Upon reading them, a look of relief and accomplishment crosses Chichester's face. He sums up his feelings in one word, justice. Now on the open seas, Delaney goes below deck to check on his injured crew. He compassionately places his hand on Lorna's shoulder as she lies in pain from her gunshot wound. Chumley is in even worse condition, burnt to a crisp and mumbling as poor sweet Godfrey tries to console him. Topside, Atticus has taken on the role of first mate, but his new job gets off to a rough start when he makes the mistake of assuming they are headed to America. Nope. Before they head to the world of cheesesteaks and New York-style pizza, Delaney needs to see a man named Colonnade in Ponta Delgada. I thought the gunpowder was for the Americans, Atticus says, confused. Delaney retorts, we are Americans. What did you think? Did this serve as a fitting end to the story in England? 